Good morning. morning. Welcome. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene. I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I heard a story. (laughs) Not about me. About two brothers who grew up on a farm. I don't have a brother, so you know it's not about me now. (laughs) Their father taught them the value of hard work tilling the soil, planting the seeds, being patient, waiting for everything to grow. The humble work of the harvester. Well, time went by. The brothers grew up. So they had to decide what they were going to do. Were they going to stay on the farm and continue in their father's work? Or were they going to go off and do other things like college or another career, something else? Well, the older brother decided, I'm going to do the humble work that my dad did. I'll just continue in this work. It's what I know how to do. Fruitful. The younger brother, nah, I'm out. I'm done with this life. And that wasn't enough for him. He had contempt for his father. He needed to make fun of him. You see, dad, he's always all hunched over from all that hard work. I don't want to be like that. I want to hold my head high. I'm going to make a name for myself. Well, the younger brother, he played guitar. Okay, I did that, but this isn't about me. (laughs) And he went off and he became a popular musician. (laughs) But he became more famous than I was. He did really well for himself. He made a career out of it. And that wasn't enough for him. He had to come back to the farm year after year and show off. Fancy new cars, the nicest clothes and watches and stuff. And every year, a different girl he'd bring with him. Well, the older brother, he had a family, settled down with his wife, kids. And now the younger brother would come over and make fun of him. Ah, the ball and chain. Well, she's going to get old someday, and you're going to be stuck with that old lady. Making fun of him, ribbing him all the time. When I'm done with this girl, she's out. I'll get another one. Year after year, same thing, every year. Well, they got older. The younger brother stopped coming by so much. Years had gone by. They hadn't seen him. Well, one day, the older brother decides to retire. I'm done. i got kids of my own. They're going to carry on the work. I can just sit here and enjoy and relax a little bit after all these years of hard work. Well, he's sitting on the porch one day, looking out over the fields at his kids, working, And the younger brother comes over. Well, he's not so young anymore. He's an older man. He sits down next to his brother. Neither of them say anything. The wife brings out some lemonade for both of them. The younger brother starts talking. He says, you know, the kids don't dig my music anymore. It's not hip. Neither is that language. So he's clearly old, right? Records? They're not selling like they used to. I don't even know if they make records anymore. The girls? Well, they see me as an old man now. They don't like me anymore. Even the girls I used to date, I look them up on the Facebook, and they've got their own families nowadays. I'm all alone. You know what? I regret not having kids now. The older brother puts his lemonade down, and he says, You see those stalks of wheat out there? You notice the ones that are standing straight up, keeping their heads held high? Well, they're like that because there's nothing in their heads. You see the stalks, though, that are bowed low to the ground? They're like that because those are the ones that produce the most grain. Put it another way. The branches of the tree that are bent lowest to the ground bear the most fruit. Today, we find ourselves in the rest of the story. No, that was not a funny one. You're meant to reflect on that one. They're not all jokes. I can't do that every single week. (laughs) I can, actually. We find ourselves in a pretty long series. That's because we're going through the whole Bible. But every once in a while, we take a break. That's a good thing. Last week was an example of your leadership being in prayer. Heather had prepared a whole message, but she scrapped it. 
and went with what God told her the church needed to hear. And so many people came up to her and said, that was exactly what I needed to hear, other staff members. So she addressed an important topic. We've talked about it before, the fear. There's a lot of fear-mongering going on nowadays. It's not good for us. She also addressed the symptom of that fear, which was anger. There's too much anger going on. We're to live in joy and peace as Christians. We've learned in this series, truly, there is nothing... <laughs> Nothing new under the sun. Read your Bible if you think things are crazy today. <laughs> it gets worse as we go along. So, great message. We needed to hear it. Even I needed to hear it. I shared that at staff meeting. So, two weeks ago, where we left off in the series, we talked about Ahab and Jehoshaphat. And usually, those lessons, and so I'm not doing it chapter by chapter because sometimes over a broader amount of chapters, you get the full picture. We saw that there. It was a lot of chapters, two different books of the Bible. It's usually used to teach people, be careful about the alliances you make, who you keep company with. Very true. But what about the good company? So we talked about that too. Your real friends don't always tell you what you want to hear. They tell you what you need to hear, and that's what we do here at C3 Church, what you need to hear. So we'll be looking at the end of Elijah's ministry. So there's these two prophets that weave their way through the stories of the kings or the accounts of these kings, Elijah and Elisha, and it's going to get even more confusing with names. You're going to get two Ahaziahs, two Jehoram's. <laughs> so I'll help you the best I can to make this easy to understand, and hopefully you'll get the point. So first, let's jump back a little bit in time to Israel. So this isn't going to be perfectly chronological. That's not the way the Bible reads. So we're going to jump back a little bit. Now, you remember that Jehoshaphat, he not only made an alliance with wicked Ahab, but then later, after Ahab dies, it almost gets him killed, he makes an alliance with his son, Ahaziah. Now, in 2 Chronicles, it says that they build this fleet of ships, and they're destroyed and everything like that. 1 Kings doesn't give us as much information about that account, but 1 Kings and 2 Kings will give us more on Elijah and Elisha. It's not in 2 Chronicles. So we're going to hop back there. We'll get back to Judah later, but today we'll be talking about Israel in the north. So 1 Kings 22:51. Ahaziah, son of Ahab, began to rule over Israel in the 17th year of King Jehoshaphat's reign in Judah. He reigned in Samaria two years, but he did what was evil in the Lord's sight, following the example of his father and mother and the example of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, who led Israel into sin, doubling down on Aaron's sin, the two golden calves, if you remember. He served Baal and worshipped him, provoking the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, just as his father had done. Now, if we turn the page, 2 Kings 1, 1. After King Ahab's death, the land of Moab rebelled against Israel. One day, Israel's new king, Ahaziah, fell through the lattice work of an upper room at his palace in Samaria. That's why I don't go up on the roof here at the church. And was seriously injured. So he sent messengers to the temple of Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, to ask whether he would recover. But the angel of the Lord told Elijah, who was from Tishbe, go and confront the messengers of the king of Samaria. So that's Israel in the north, the capital city, Samaria. Is there no God in Israel? Why are you going to Beelzebub, the god of Ekron, to ask whether the king will recover? Now, therefore, this is what the Lord says. You will never leave the bed you are lying on. You will surely die. So Elijah went to deliver the message. So I'm going to summarize this for you. The messengers come back too soon. And King Ahaziah is like, why are you back so early? They say, well, a messenger gave us this message for you. And they repeat pretty much verbatim what Elijah said, what I just read to you. You will surely die. You didn't trust God. You went to these false gods. You're dead. It's over. So Ahaziah says, what did the guy look like? Well, he was a hairy man. He wore a leather belt. Remember that. So he says... Elijah from Tishbe. He knows who it is. So here's what you're going to do. 
he gets 50 men. So 50 is going to be an important number. It keeps circulating through these chapters. 50 men and an army captain to go apprehend, to go arrest Elijah. The picture here is Elijah sitting on a hill. The army captain comes up to him and he says, man of God, come down here. Basically, you're going to come see the king with me. He says, if I am a man of God, then let fire rain down from heaven and burn you all up, kill you and your men. That's what happens. They burn up. Well, same thing. Second captain, another 50 men. Same thing happens. Same dialogue, everything's the same. Third time, the third captain's a little smarter. He goes up to him, oh man of God, please spare my life, the lives of your servants, these soldiers. For fire came down and burned them up. Don't kill me, he's saying. So 2 Kings 1.15, the angel of the Lord said to Elijah, go down with him and don't be afraid of him. So Elijah got up and went with him to the king. And Elijah said to the king, this is what the Lord says. Why did you send messengers to Belzebub, the god of Ekron, to ask whether you will recover? Is there no god in Israel to answer your question? Therefore, because you have done this, you will never leave the bed you're lying on. You will surely die. So Ahaziah died, just as the Lord had promised through Elijah. Since Ahaziah did not have a son to succeed him, his brother Joram became the next king. This took place in the second year of the reign of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah. The rest of the events in Ahaziah's life and everything he did are recorded in the book of the history of the kings of Israel. This is really confusing with names now. <laughs> because Joram is Ahab's son. Ahaziah doesn't have his own son, but... Your Bible might mark this differently. There are actually two Jehorams there. <laughs> Joram is really Jehoram. So very confusing. There are two at the same time. We'll talk about it in Bible study if you have more questions. So now, remember Elisha. So he is Elijah, who called down fire from heaven, his successor, basically like his assistant. And briefly summarizing the story, 1 Kings 19, we saw how he was chosen. The Lord told him, go anoint him, or we would say appoint him. Thing you do with oil. They used the anointing all over sheep to stop the bugs from getting in their ears and killing them. Anyway, too much information probably. <laughs> so he anoints him, but he does so in a very interesting way. He finds him working in the field with 12 teams of oxen. Elisha's with the last team of oxen. Elijah walks up to him and throws his cloak over him, puts his mantle on him. Walks away. Elisha knows what this means. So he runs up to Elijah and he says, let me say goodbye to my parents. Literally, let me, let me kiss them. Let me say goodbye to them. Okay, but think about what I've done to you. So then he does an interesting thing. He kills all the oxen, slaughters them, and gives them to the townspeople. Two things at play here. Maybe more. Generosity. Two, a complete commitment to this ministry. He's done away with the way he used to make his livelihood. He's now all in, no going back. Important point there. So now from where we were in 2 Kings 1, if we turn the page, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. But Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went down together to Bethel. The group of prophets from Bethel came to Elisha and asked him, did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? Of course I know, answered Elijah, Elisha. Sorry, Be quiet about it. So this is interesting. It kind of reminds me of Ruth with Naomi. You know, I'll never leave you. I'm going to cling to you. So, it keeps going. We're going to have three cycles again. Then Elijah said to Elijah, stay here. The Lord's now called me to go to Jericho. Remember Jericho. But Elijah replied again, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I'll never leave you. So, the same thing happens with the prophets, but they're there. Do you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you? Of course I know, but be quiet about it. I don't want to talk about it. Third time. And again, like the 50 soldiers, there's 50 prophets. Then Elijah said, stay here. I'm going to go to the Jordan River. 
No, as long as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I'll never leave you. But this time, a 50 group of prophets doesn't ask him the question. They watch them go down to the river. And you get an interesting scene. First of all, Elijah says to Elisha, and this is going to be important, tell me what I can do for you before you're taken away. Now we get the scene that everyone remembers where he slaps his coat. That's before that. All right, so he's going to say that, and I want you to remember that. So first, he folds up his cloak, the mantle. The cloak was important. He slaps the Jordan River with it, and it parts. They cross over on dry ground. Sounds like Joshua, right? So then he asks him the question. Keep this in your head. Tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken away. And Elisha replied, please let me inherit a double share, a double portion of your spirit. And become your successor. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied. But if you see me when I'm taken away from you, you'll get it. If you don't, you won't. So as they're walking along and talking, a chariot of fire comes and divides them, just like the waters were divided. And then all of a sudden, Elijah's taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. Now, as he's disappearing, he says, my father, my father, I see the chariots and charioteers of Israel. And as they disappeared, remember this, he tears his clothes in grief. He's grieving. He's upset. His master's gone. Then Elijah picks up the cloak that had been left behind and does the same thing to get back across the river. 2 Kings 2.15, when the group of prophets from Jericho saw from a distance what had happened, they exclaimed, Elijah's spirit rests upon Elisha. And they went to meet him, bowed to the ground before him. Sir, they said, just say a word, and 50 of our strongest men will search the wilderness for your master. Perhaps the spirit of the Lord has left him on some mountain or in some valley. No, Elisha said, don't send them. But they kept urging him until they shamed him into agreeing and finally he said, all right, send them. So the 50 men searched for three days but did not find Elijah. Elijah was still at Jericho when they returned. Didn't I tell you not to go? He asked. Now, Elijah was a forerunner to Elisha. And we'll see that he literally gets a double portion. Elijah is taken up into heaven. One of two people so far in the series who that happened to. Remember in Genesis, Enoch gets taken up as well. Now, not sure about Enoch, but the Word of God says that Elijah would come back. Where does it say that? The last book of the Old Testament. In fact, it's the last line that tells us that in Malachi. He's one of the prophets that probably came and prophesied during the time of Ezra, Nehemiah. That's why he's last, one of the latter prophets. Malachi is an interesting book. You probably, if you've been in church your whole life, heard Malachi 3.10 to get you to tithe. <laughs> totally and completely taken out of context every single time. I'll give you the context. Here's what's happening. And there's a more interesting line than that that pastors leave out, and I'll share it with you. Anyway, the whole picture we're supposed to get here is that the Israelites are offering up worthless sacrifices, and God's done with it. He's not counting it as worship. So literally it says they're bringing God the lame and blind sheep. So what they're doing is something that might sound a little familiar to <clears throat> some of you. Anyway, what they're doing is they're making sure that they're all set first. And then they're giving God the leftovers. That's the context. In Malachi 3.10 will say, hey, you know, make sure there's plenty in the temple of the Lord and you know, your storehouses will overflow. Right? So this is the magic formula, right? But it's all about the heart. So that's the crux of Malachi. There's a thing about divorce in there, a little digression. They're divorcing their Israelite brides, which is why I say hate divorce, and they're marrying these foreign women. Not good, adopting their practices. This is what happens over and over and over again. So that's the context of Malachi. My favorite line is when it says, I'm going to rub poop in your face. That's actually in there. Go ahead and read it. You can find it and tell me where it was. <laughs> the context, this is the context, right? This is what's going on. 
In the midst of that context, it says this, Malachi 3.1, so before the whole tithing thing, the pastor's like, look, I'm sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, whom you look for so eagerly. His surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Now, if we turn the page, it will identify him. Malachi 4.5, look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. Otherwise, I will come and strike the land with a curse. And that's the way it ends. And so we're left there in the Old Testament waiting for Elijah. A lot of people don't realize this. They don't put that together. They're just like, oh, here we go. But they're waiting for Elijah. There's an expectation. And one of the things that kind of makes it confusing is because if we turn the page or a couple pages, you'll get a page that says New Testament, right? And then if you turn that page, you get Matthew chapter 1. And we go through this big old genealogy. And then we go through some stuff about when Jesus was a kid. Then we get to the important part. Now, a lot of scholars will say that Mark was written first, not Matthew. So it was Mark, Matthew, Luke and John maybe. But traditionally, Matthew is said to have been written first. But what's interesting is if you go to Mark first, so if you just read that line in Malachi about Elijah, and then you go to Mark, an interesting thing happens. Mark 1.1. This is the good news about Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. It began just as the prophet Isaiah had written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, and he will prepare your way. Also, that's Malachi 3.1. He is a voice shouting in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord's coming. Clear the road for him. Isaiah 43. But that's the Greek version, not the Hebrew version of the Old Testament. The messenger was John the Baptist. He was in the wilderness and preached that people should be baptized to show that they had repented of their sins and turned to God to be forgiven. All of Judea, including all the people of Jerusalem, went out to see and hear John. And when they confessed their sins, he baptized them in the Jordan River. His clothes were woven from coarse camel hair, and he wore a leather belt around his waist. For food, he ate locusts and wild honey. Gross. He even looks like Elijah. Elijah. <laughs> now, you may take me to John, and you might say, wait a minute. In John 1, John the Baptist, the baptizer, does, he says, I'm not the Messiah, but they ask him because they're expecting Elijah. I'm not Elijah. He says he's not, but Mark says something different. And so does the angel Gabriel, if we go to Luke's gospel account. Luke 1.12, so Zechariah, I'll explain it to you in case you don't know, is Elijah's, right, John the Baptist's father. All right, so he's his dad, he's a priest, he's on his turn to, the, to burn incense in the temple, he's a member of the priestly line of Abijah. So that's what he's doing, he's in the temple, it says they're old, him and his wife Elizabeth, they're blameless according to the law, but they're really old, they can't have kids. This is what happened. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw the angel appearing to him. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah, God has heard your prayer, your wife Elizabeth will give you a son. And you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness and, men, gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. It's kind of like a Nazarite vow is what they would call that. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. And he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to accept the wisdom of the godly. So that sounds exactly like what we met, read in Malachi. So now, it's not just here. Jesus clarifies it as well. So I'm going to tie a bunch of things together for you really quickly. Remember, everything's a foreshadowing. 
Right? So it's pointing to Jesus eventually, everything. It's all, it's, it's all happening here. So when the law is given, Exodus 19, we saw like all those elements. Remember? The earthquake and the lightning, the fire. It's this big and loud event. The trumpet blast getting louder and louder and louder. Then later, remember Elijah, he sent 40 days to Mount Sinai. He fasts just like Moses did, 40 days on the mountain. He gets to Mount Sinai. What are you doing, Elijah? Tells him to stand at the foot of the mountain. Then we see elements again, very similar. A wind blast, there's an earthquake, and then there's fire. But it says here, God wasn't in any of those elements. He spoke in whisper. So things are changing a little bit. Now, when you put the whole thing together and you hop on over to Acts during Pentecost, which is where they're celebrating, what happened on the mountain with Moses, the giving of the law, now the Spirit is given. It's a replacement or a fulfillment in Jesus, giving the Holy Spirit here. And it says, tongues of fire. What was important about that? Remember the contest on Mount Carmel? It says that the tongue of fire, like it licked up the water. So now there, you get a fulfillment of that, or you get a little preview of what was going to happen. Amazing. It all comes together. But something else happens regarding Elijah and Moses, who are both doing this stuff on Mount Sinai. We get the transfiguration. Jesus takes Peter, James, and John up on the holy mountain, as Peter later will call it. And Moses and Elijah appear. Jesus' face becomes radiant and bright, really, really white. And this is how John, later writing Revelation, not John the Baptist, John the disciple, writing Revelation, that's how Jesus appears to him. So it's a preview of this. Bam, Moses and Elijah are there. Disciples freak out. Peter's like, should we build three tabernacles or memorial shelters for you? They don't know what to do. God the Father speaks. This is my son who brings me great joy. Listen to him. They freak out and fall down. Jesus says, get up. But then this happens. Matthew, it's one of the accounts, one of the places. Mark 9 is another. As they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Then his disciples asked him, think about it, why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? They know he's the Messiah. Wait a minute, Elijah just appeared. Jesus replied, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready, but I tell you, Elijah has already come, but he wasn't recognized, and they chose to abuse him. And in the same way, they will also make the Son of Man suffer. Then the disciples realized Jesus was talking about John the Baptist. He's saying John the Baptist is Elijah, at least in spirit and in power. That was a lot, but you can see over the last few weeks how all of this comes together in an amazing, amazing way. That's what being in the full counsel of God's Word is all about. It's amazing when you can see the big picture here, and how it's all perfectly and beautifully connected. Flawless. Unreal. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people don't understand this about John the Baptist. Not just the Elijah thing. A lot of people don't get that. But they don't understand who he was. He was a really, really big deal. In fact, outside historians write about him, like Josephus. You see, he had a lot of followers, a really, really big, big following. He was preparing the way for Jesus. Now, here's the thing on our application today. Even though he had a lot of followers, take a look at what it says. So, background. There's a debate among his disciples, John chapter 3. See, we stop at 316, right? And that's it. We don't want to read any more than that. For God so loved the world, he gave us one. And that's it. That's the verse of the day. And that's why we don't understand this stuff, because that's what you do. You just read the verse of the day, and you stop. I hate it. Anyway, good that you're reading something, but then getting it all wrong. So if we keep reading, <laughs> here's what happens. There's a debate. There's a lot of stuff about John, the first three chapters of John. 
different John, right? So John the disciple writing, John the Baptist. I know, it's confusing. A lot of people have the same names. Anyway, <laughs> there's a debate. What's the debate about? Nobody talks about this. Think about it. John has this huge following. It says all, it's hyperbole in the beginning, Mark. All of Judea, like every single person. But he wants to make a big deal about it. Everybody's coming to John. We don't think about that. So this is a guy with like a mega church. Think about it in a modern context, right? Not going to name any names, not going to name any names, not going to name any names. So you get this mega church, right? Preaching is a giant church in a modern context. So the people in the church come up to the pastor and they say, everybody's leaving our church to go to the church across the street. What are we going to do? So this is what happens. Everybody's leaving to go to Jesus, to go to the Messiah. They're leaving you, John. So what's the response? John 3.27, John replied, no one can receive anything unless God gives it <laughs> from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you, I am not the Messiah. I am only here to prepare the way for him. It is the bridegroom who marries the bride, and the bridegroom's friend is simply glad just to stand with him and hear his vows. Therefore, I am filled with joy at his success. He must become greater and greater. I must become less and less. He must increase. I must decrease. Say, pastors, never. <laughs> right? We want to grow our churches really big. That's what it's all about. Elijah was, again, a forerunner to Elisha and then later John. Likewise, John is a forerunner to Jesus. But Jesus is a forerunner to no one. John 3, 31. He, Jesus, is John, has come from above and is greater than anyone else. We are of the earth and we speak of earthly things, but he has come from heaven and is greater than everyone else, just in case you didn't catch it the first time. Jesus is greater than John. Jesus is greater than Elijah. Jesus is greater than Elisha. He is certainly greater than me. This is the posture we must have as Christians, baby Jesuses. Now, don't get me wrong. Elijah, Elisha, they did some pretty cool things. Some denominations venerate them for this reason. But they weren't looking for that. Elisha followed Elijah loyally, serving him as his assistant. Important to remember that. When he was taken up in the whirlwind, what did he do? I told you to remember this. He grieved. He tore his clothes. He didn't want him to go. He didn't want his job. And the prophets, do you know what's going to happen to your master? Ah, of course I know. I don't want to talk about it. He wasn't going after his own fame or trying to make a name for himself. He asked for that double portion so that he can more successfully do the Lord's work, not his own. That was the point. Also, unlike Jesus, they're just people. It would be short-sighted to over-venerate them and get stuck on them and miss Jesus. That's what happens sometimes. You see, a herald is what they are, is someone who draws attention temporarily to themselves in order to get them to someone else or something else. That's the point. And I've done this Chinese proverb before, not because I know a lot of stuff about Chinese proverbs. I'm not going to try to sound smart. It's because it's in a Bruce Lee movie. So that's how I know this. <laughs> and he says, it's like a finger pointing at the moon. If you focus on the finger, you miss the moon and all its heavenly glory. Interesting. We do that, though, don't we? We get stuck on the finger a lot. Now, if we go a step beyond that proverb... Just beyond it, think about it. The moon 
doesn't produce light on its own. It's just reflecting the sun. Alone, it's dark. All alone, we're dark. We are to just simply reflect Christ. That is our job, especially in this very dark world. Now, here's the thing. I know where some people will try to get me. They're going to say, okay, Pastor Gene, I've seen your Instagram. And there's a lot of followers on there. Again, a herald. Gather like John the Baptist. You can gather a following, but you must always point them over to Jesus. When it's time to hand them over, yes, go. He must become greater and greater. That's the thing. Look at the posts. They're all about Jesus, <laughs> every single one of them. That's all I talk about. It's important. Right? I'm great, but don't follow me. <laughs> follow Jesus. He must become greater and greater. And that is remarkable. If you go to John 1, he says, look, there is the Lamb of God. People start following him. One of them's Andrew. That's Simon Peter's brother. Get Simon Peter. And Peter follows him. People are leaving John. John is losing followers to Jesus. Go follow him. He's greater than me. So fine, build up a social media account, build up a church. But the point is, you must be telling people, follow Jesus, follow Jesus. I'm just trying to be something like him. So in that way, be like me, but follow Jesus. Don't be a follower of me. We went over the woman at the well, John 4, very famous account. It's another example where people know this story, but then they don't know an important one right after it. So there's this encounter with the woman at the well. Jesus is tired. He wants a drink of water. Samaritan woman's there. And we talked about that opposition to the Samaritan. The Jews and the Samaritans don't like each other in the series. We learned why. You Jews normally don't have anything to do. Get me a cup of water. And so he goes into this dialogue about the water. I have living water that leads to eternal life. And how, she says, how can this water from Jacob's well here be better than what you have? I have the water that leads to eternal life. You drink from that well, you're just going to keep getting thirsty again. Then he goes into a dialogue about true worship, worshiping in spirit and in truth on this mountain, Gerizim, or in the temple in Jerusalem. But he's getting to a point. I am the Messiah. She says, oh, I know the Messiah will come and explain everything. I am the Messiah. Well, he blows her mind because he knows she's promiscuous. You have had five husbands, and none of them are your husbands. So she thinks, ooh, you must be a prophet. Anyway, after the Messiah comment, she goes away, but not in time for his disciples to see him hanging out with a woman. But they don't dare ask him why. It's kind of weird. So here's where people stop, or right before that, so they say to him, why don't you eat something? He says, I have a food you know nothing about. So they figure, well, someone must have fed him. John 4, 34, then Jesus explained, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. You know the saying, four months between planting and harvest, but I say, wake up. And look around. The fields are already ripe for the harvest. The harvesters are paid good wages, and the fruit they harvest is people brought to eternal life. What joy awaits both the planter and the harvester alike? You know the saying, one plants and another harvests, and it's true. I sent you to harvest where you didn't plant. Others had already done the work, and now you will get to gather the harvest. You see, we are to be seed planters for the sake of the gospel. I'll wrap up with a little context here for you. 1 Corinthians. Paul's writing to a messed up church. I'm going to give this challenge probably today to some people, but I talked about it at a Bible study. It's worth remarking on. The book is made up of a lot of different books, and they're all different kinds of literature. They're not the same. We have poetry, literature in there. You have the Psalms. You have history books like we're looking at. And you have letters, epistles. <laughs> There's things written to different churches and different, literally different people. That's important to remember. So when you look at Paul's letters, 13 books of the Bible, 
Most of them are not general. He even mentions very specific people in them. Right? So if I write a letter to Lonnie about something going on in church, it's going to be different to the letter I write to Ray. He might be doing something I don't like. Right? You might be sleeping. So you got to wake up in church, you know, or whatever it is. I might use some hyperbole like, hey, put some toothpicks over your eyes. And here's what happens. 2,000 years later, everybody's sitting in church with toothpicks on their eyes, and they don't know why. It's a thing called context. Really important. So be careful about taking Paul literally. <laughs> you can end up doing some bad things to yourself or other people. But there are church-wide, they call them Catholic epistles. Don't be scared. They're not literally like denominationally Catholic. It means universal. Right? So it's to all churches in general. James, 1 John, well, 1st, 2nd Peter 1st. First John's was a challenge. I told everybody, listen, before you listen to the other stuff, you got your church message, which is where your pastors, they pray about what you need to hear. Keep listening to that, even if you're online from far away. Good. But outside of that, a lot of you listen to other sermons from other people. Nobody vets anybody, and they come back to me with a bunch of weird questions. Annoying. Anyway, so <laughs> instead of listening to that stuff, turn it off and just listen to God's Word. Trust me, it's better. All right? So God's Word, and read those books. James, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. First John, seven times before you listen to anything else, and you'll discover something if you're smart. The Bible doesn't read like most people preach. So 1 Corinthians, I had to do that. One through four, this is the first messed up issue in a messed up church, but really probably not even as bad as us. 1 Corinthians one through four is all about a topic I like to call pastor worship. Like 2,000-something years later, we still do this today. It's the first problem that Paul addresses. So first, he says, I heard a report from Chloe's household that some of you are saying things like, I follow Apollos. And if you go to Acts 18, you learn that Apollos is a really eloquent, great, great speaker. So some of you are saying, I follow him. Some of you are saying, I follow Peter. Some of you are saying, I follow Paul. Has Christ been divided? He gets angry right out the gate. I'm glad I baptized none of you. Because then you might say you were baptized in the name of Paul. Imagine a pastor saying, I'm glad I didn't baptize. Oh, except Crispus, Gaius, and Stephanus' household. Right? So you know it's hyperbole. Those guys are cool. You're not. Another thing, someone tells on the people there. Chloe's household. That's pretty awesome. Anyway, so that's why he's writing the letter. Think about it. <laughs> I'm glad I baptized none of you. Because you might say you were baptized in the name of Pastor Gene. That's not good. He gets really upset about it. He ends that segment. There are no chapter numbers in the original. Chapter 4. Should I come at you with love, like a father, or with a stick? Imagine me saying that. Like, man, I'm going to beat you. <laughs> That's what he's saying. So now... Do pastors get permission forever to beat their congregation? I'm sure that's where the nuns got it. I don't know. <laughs> Some of you are my age or older. <laughs> the celebrity pastors, finger, stuck there, missing you know, the moon or the sun. They're short-sighted. So in the midst of this, this is what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 3, 5. After all, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We are only God's servants through whom you believe the good news. Each of us did the work the Lord gave us. I planted the seed in your hearts, and Apollos watered it. But it was God who made it grow. It's not important who does the planting or who does the watering. What's important is that God makes the seeds grow. We are simply planting seeds, and through our humility, it is through our humility that we then begin to assume the right posture of worship. And that is how we live our lives. We must always remember God causes the growth. It's not about our legacy. It's about his. To him, all glory and honor forever and ever Amen.